Well, baseball spring training is over, but the St. Louis Cardinals will open their regular season on the road at Pittsburgh at PNC Park against the Pirates this Sunday, and that'll be the overall first game in Major League Baseball, the Cardinals and the Pirates this Sunday. And the Cardinals, of course, will be going after their fourth straight Central Division title and hopefully another berth in the World Series, another World Series championship. And if you think about it, the Cardinals won the World Series back in 2006. They won it five years later in 2011. Here we are five years later in 2016. So if you like that five-year plan, well, 2016 could be a very special year. And with us on the phone this morning is a guy who played a very big role in that 2011 season. He was one of the outstanding pitchers for the Cardinals that season and made quite an impact, and he joins us right now, and that's former Cardinal pitcher Kyle McClellan. Good morning, Kyle. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Great. Good to have you on the sports couch with us. And, uh, hey, you just got back from spring training yourself, and, of course, you spent a lot of time down there broadcasting some of the games on Cardinals.com with KMOX Sports Director Tom Ackerman, and it seemed like you two were having a good time doing those games, and I must say you did a great job, and I think you had fun, didn't you? Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, it was it was interesting. You know, I, I had no uh, coaching or teaching anything going into that, so the color side of it, you know, you're just you're you're watching the game and talking about what you see. So that it was the harder things were when to jump in. You know, you had to you had to get your point across quickly. Uh, so there was a lot of things. We we I did five games while I was down there, but I learned quite a bit. I did a couple innings of play by play as well. So uh, it was good to get some experience and to do it. And you definitely have an appreciation for for those guys and how good they are and how tough of a job that is. Well, Tom's a good guy to learn from, too, because he's so smooth and does a, a great job with the play-by-play. But, but no, I thought you did an outstanding job, and I thought you guys blended well together, so I'm glad you had the opportunity to do that. I'm sure you've got to be excited about what you see out of this Cardinal team this year going into 2016. Yeah, I think they're going to be they're going to be just fine. Look, the starting rotation, as long as they can stay healthy, and you can say that for the Cubs, you can say that for – uh, for anybody, for the Nationals, you know, any, any of these teams that are getting talked about, they have to stay healthy. And the Cardinals are, are no exception. If their rotation stays healthy, they're going to have one of the top rotations in, in all of baseball. And their bullpen is, you know, Jordan Walden with him uh, being out is, is certainly a blow to them, but they still have so many guys that can pitch in the late innings. So they're going to have a very good bullpen. They're not going to give up a lot of runs this year. Offensively, I think they're going to be better. I think you're going to see the development of Gritchick and Scotty. You're going to see Matt Holiday healthy, Matt Adams hopefully healthy for, for a full season, and I think those offensive numbers are going to climb. So the card, they're going to be just fine. They have to stay healthy. they got to keep Yachty healthy, which is obviously, uh, you know, he, he's the key component of that team. But, you know, they're going to be there in the thick of it. They're going to be there in October. Uh, or they're playing with a chance to play in October uh, once the season comes to an end. So uh, I, they, they're, uh, they were exciting to watch all spring, and there's, there's – um, there's a lot for Cardinals fans to be excited about. Oh, I agree. And we'll get into a little bit more of that discussion about this year's team in just a moment. But one of the reasons why we want to have you on the show this morning, Kyle, is we want to give you a chance to talk about something else that you're very passionate about, and, and that is the fact that you like, to, you like to give back and you like to help those in need, and you especially have some compassion for children. And I know that you took a trip to Haiti with Adam Wainwright, and it made you aware of some needs that were taking place down there and in other parts of the world, too. And so you were moved by that so much that you've actually started your own organization or foundation that's called Brace for Impact, and you're the founder and president of that. Tell us about Brace for Impact and what you've been up to here lately. Yeah, you know, like you said, Adam Wainwright invited me and my wife on a trip in January of 2014 to go with him and his wife and a a group of people to go see an orphanage in Haiti that they had helped fund. And when we went down there, it really, before then, to be honest with you, we had kind of uh, stiff-armed international giving. We wanted to to do something more local and be more involved with it. And that really opened our eyes to, one, how big the world is, and, and two, how big of a need there is, and, and that we could help. And so we came back from that trip, and a foundation is always something we wanted to do, understanding when I played here in St. Louis and being from here that this was the, the height of my platform. But it just wasn't the right time. I, I, I tried to put myself in a bubble and, and not let people get to me when I played because of playing in my hometown, and I just didn't want – uh, one more thing I had to deal with. So I want to be very involved with it. Uh, I don't want to just put my name on it and have somebody else run it. So it just wasn't the right time. But uh, after that trip, I knew my career was kind of coming to an end. We started the foundation. We raised $212,750 uh, to build an addition onto the orphanage that Adam and Jenny had built. And I just, like you said, got back from my fourth time being down there. Since that trip, I've been down three other times. I'm going again in June. And we take people down there to, to expose them to a lot of these other things that 
my wife and I had no clue were going on in these third world countries. And we're going to continue to support our, our efforts there in Haiti. We actually have a new website that's going to be coming up here pretty soon. And we're also doing some stuff here in St. Louis. So we get a lot of people that say, you know, why, why would you help over there and not help in St. Louis? And uh, I have a lot of different answers for that. But one of the things is we are helping in St. Louis, and we're going to do some community development here as well. And like you said, our emphasis is on children. We, have, we understand that if we can get to some of these children that have unfortunate situations and help them and break that cycle, and then hopefully they will raise their kids differently and have a different outlook on life because of, of our funds and what we're doing, uh, then we know we're successful. So we plan to, to do big things not only down in Haiti but here in St. Louis as well and, and help lots of, lots of families and lots of children have more successful and productive lives. Yeah, you mentioned that you like to take other people down there with you and expose them to it. I know this last trip you went down to Haiti that you just returned from a few weeks ago, you actually took, uh, I believe, Charlie Brennan and Debbie Monterey and maybe some other people from KMOX down there with you. And, and I think 19 of the people you took on this last trip were seeing Haiti for the first time. Isn't that true? Yeah, well, 19 were seeing that, that, not just Haiti, but anything like that for the first time. And, and Debbie... And Charlie were on the trip with us. Charlie brought his wife and his two kids. Debbie brought her daughter, and uh, and and it was I think it was very eye opening for them. They've been on tons of trips and done lots of things, and um, they had a lot of great things to say about it. And you know, I, I took my boss, the program director Steve Moore of KMOX, with me in August. And and the reason I do that is I want, and I told him I want them to see the other side of what I do. I work for KMOX, and I and I do a lot of stuff, you know, during the season. And, but that's a fraction of the time that's spent on what I do on the foundation. And I want them to understand fully why I spend so much time with it and what the time that I spend is going towards. And, and it, I think it really opened the eyes of, of our program director, Charlie and, and Debbie, who I think were, were very pleasantly surprised by what's going on down there. And, uh, look, running a nonprofit is, is not easy. It's just my wife and I, and, and uh, it, it takes a lot of time. And it's very, we, we don't take a salary. We don't make a penny on it. Uh, it's all of our time is donated, and um, but we know that it's worth it. We're just trying to get more people exposed to to what we're doing and the type of work we're doing because it, it's you can't just you know pictures and video don't really they don't really do it justice. So you got to get people down there and expose them, and we got a lot of momentum coming out of that group, and hopefully some great things that come uh, because of it. Yeah, that's great. I know you said you have another new website that's coming up about the foundation here soon, but you have an existing one up right now that people can take a look at, too, and that's called Brace4Impact46.com. Just spell that out, Brace4Impact, followed by the number 46.com. And you mentioned that you raised over $212,000 initially to help out with that addition down there at that children's school in Haiti, and that's money that goes a long way in a country like Haiti, doesn't it? Well, it, it, it's, it's actually, you'd be surprised. So, the cost of goods down there are equal, if not more expensive, than the United States because everything has to be imported. So that $212,000 and what we built there would build you something similar here because of the, the cost of materials. But what we also did with that money is we created jobs for 55 Haitian construction workers for 12 months while they were building the school. So we got to support 55 families through that. And then also, now that this is, is completed, 32 kids now have uh, a great home there where they're going to be raised and and um, and have food and shelter and, and clothes and medical attention. Uh, they get a Bible education. They also get a 12th grade education all because of that. So that $212,000 was, you know, we're getting a great return on our investment as far as uh, of, of the help that we provided and, and the food that we provided for, you know, like I said, for those workers over there. But, yeah, I mean, the average Haitian lives on $2 a day. So, wow. And when I, when I tell you that the goods are very similar, try to – you know, sit down with your family at night and think about feeding everybody at your table on, on two, not just one meal, on $2 per person, and then think about doing that for the day. And the average wage is, is less than $2 a day for a Haitian worker. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough country, and, and we know that the things we're doing there are, are, are making a big difference. Is clean, available water, is that one of the issues in Haiti as it is in some other places? Haiti is one of the most difficult places to get water, and there's a lot of reasons for it. One, it's very rocky, and so you have to drill down very deep to get to the clean water because of years and hundreds and hundreds of years of human contamination. So they don't have toilets there. There's no plumbing system, so people go out and go to the bathroom outside their house, and then that seeps down into the soil, and then that contaminates the water. So to get to the clean water, you have to drill down so deep 
that many people can't do it because of the rocky conditions. So clean water is a huge issue, just like it is in a lot of third world countries. We are teamed up with an organization called Water Missions, and they have a water filtration system that can take any water and turn it into 99% clean. They put a chlorine tablet in there, kills the rest of the 1%. So it has made a huge impact on that community, the fact that we've been able to put in four clean water filtration systems. That's 12,000 people per day now have access to clean water. On top of that, there's been 125 latrines put in, so we're giving people the opportunity to go to the bathroom in a toilet. And I, I went to one guy's house that had this toilet, and I said, what do you think of the toilet? He said, I, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I've never, me or anybody in my family has never used a toilet before. You know, and those are the things that you just don't realize until you go over there and see it, that the, the way that these people are living, um, it, it's it's nothing that we've ever seen here in the United States. Well, I shouldn't say ever, but nothing we've seen in the United States in my lifetime. But it, you certainly feel like they're trapped back in the 17 or 1800s in, in, in survival mode. We're talking with former St. Louis Cardinals pitcher Kyle McClellan, who has since retired, of course, from Major League Baseball, but does some work for KMOX. And he also has a new foundation that he started, which is called Brace for Impact. And we're talking about that right now. Kyle, a lot of people would say, well, how do you bridge the gap of the of the language barrier there with the folks of Haiti. And, and I heard you say in an, in an earlier interview, I think it might have been on KMOX, where you said, you know, we don't necessarily speak the same language as the kids in Haiti, but the universal language is actually love, and, and that connects all of us, and how true that is. Yeah, it, it's very true. The, the kids, there's there's three different orphanages over there that we're kind of associated with. Uh, two of them, they speak English, and the kids here at, at I to D, which, which we funded, eventually will, but they're all seven years or younger. So they're just getting into the early stages of school, but they'll eventually have English uh, in, as, a, as a class. Uh, so that way it gives them an advantage once they graduate. But, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You, you go to the, to the older ones and you can kick the soccer ball with them and play basketball and communicate with them and, and, and talk to them about you know, what, how long they've been in the orphanage and, and all these things and get to know them. And then you go to I to D, and, you, and the kids just look at you, and, and they want you to pick them up, and, and they're hugging on you, and, and, and carrying, you're carrying them, two or three of them around at a time, and you, you can't really communicate. They know maybe a couple words, but, but there's very few, but we spent all day with them. We spent from 9 in the morning till 6 at night. We gave the moms a day off, and we sent them to the beach and gave them money to go get lunch. They get one day off a month. And wow. So we, we gave them an extra day, and, I mean, they're 24-7. And so we, we took the kids, 32 kids, from 9 a.m. till uh, 6 p.m., and we don't speak their language. But it was a great day. It was an amazing day. Uh, we got to spend so much time with them and play with them. We throw a ball. I mean, you know, that that right there put, breaks down a lot of barriers. And, and like you said, I mean, we just we just sit there and let them know that, that we love them and, and we care for them, and, and um, you know, that, that goes a long way. I, I wish there was more of that in the world, you know, and, and I feel like a lot of these problems that we have would go away. But uh, it, 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 was, it was certainly a special time, and I think everybody in our group – um, I don't know if I would say look forward to, to being responsible for that many kids for that long, but at the end of the day, I think everybody was, was very thankful we got the opportunity to do that, and, and it was something that we'll never forget. Well, it gives you an entirely new perspective on life, particularly when you return here to the United States, doesn't it? Yeah, it was. A, I tell you what, I came back. I've, I've gone four times, so I knew, you know, I know what I'm getting into, and I came back, and I was with my parents and my, my wife, and we ran into... To the store down there, grocery store Publix, which is you know like a Schnucks or Deerberg mm-hmm. or Walmart up here, and and uh, and I just I walked in, and I was just kind of in a daze, and my mom was like, "Are you okay?" And I said, "This is just this is very weird to me, you know where we've been for the last four days, the fact that you we can just hop in a car, walk into a store and get absolutely. I mean, there's there's 30 aisles full of anything you want food wise." And when you think about those people in, in Haiti that are walking, on average, three miles a day just to get, you know, rice or beans that will hopefully last them for the week, it's uh, it, it's tough to process. So I always tell people in our group on the last day, it's going to be hard. You're going to struggle when you get back. You're going to want to tell people about it. And people, some people are going to be genuinely interested. Some people are going to think you're crazy because it doesn't matter because it's a third world country or it's not in the United States. And it's going to be hard to relate it to them. I said, the other thing is it's going to be hard for you to process what you've seen in three or four days, and then when you get back to the States, everything's so drastically different, and, and you're going to jump back in the routine of things. Um, but it, there, there's a lot of things that stick out now that you just kind of chuckle about and go, man, this is 
we're very, very fortunate to, to have access to a lot of these things. There's a lot of people that have no clue that the world that we live in even exists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so true. If someone wants to donate to your foundation, Brace for Impact, what's the best way for them to do that, Kyle? Yeah, the best way would be right there on our website. It's braceforimpact46.com. And uh, you can go on there and see the video that we did. And, and it, it, it tells you we raised $212,750. And, and right now, uh, for about the next, we should be launching this website in about a, in about a week, the new one. But it, all that money will go to the Pittsburgh Kids Foundation, and that's the, that's the uh, organization that we support. So we take the money, we issue a check to the Pittsburgh Kids Foundation. Uh, Brad Henderson, who's the president of that, has been the one that has got Adam and myself involved and leads all our trips. Uh, he's been in Haiti for 20, 25 years now, and he's, been, he's watched this whole process take place and, and been responsible for this. So a uh, great organization over there, and we're happy to support them and come alongside and, and be fundraisers for them. So braceforimpact46.com would be the place to go. And mm-hmm. uh, they also, on the Pittsburgh Kids Foundation, have a sponsorship program where you can sponsor a child in Haiti for 25 bucks a month. You can provide uh, food and medical care and, and clothing for a child, and that's a that's a big program for us. If we can get the word out on that and and get more people involved in that, that will really help offset some of our costs that that um, that us and the Pittsburgh Kids Foundation share as far as keeping these kids going, and we can continue to to move forward with with new um, construction and, and and new developments in that country if we can get the everyday cost covered because we. We have a lot more going on, so obviously our costs go up. We want to make sure these kids are taken care of before we get to some of these new additions. Sure. Again, that website is braceforimpact46.com. Just spell it out. That's braceforimpact46.com, and you can make your donation on there and find out more information about the foundation that Kyle has set up. A couple of quick baseball questions about the current Cardinals team before we let you go here, Kyle. Uh, I'd say probably one of the best surprises about what we saw from this Cardinals team at spring training probably has to be the emergence of Jeremy Hazelbaker. Would you agree? He was outstanding. I, I tell you what, you watched him early on and you thought, oh, okay, he's, you know, he's doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden he's still around and he's still around. And he's still hitting and he's playing good defense. And, uh, and then last week it's like, okay, this guy, you know, a couple things happened. This guy may make the team. And so he, he really had a great spring. And um, you, you look at where he's come from and, and how he's, uh, got to this point, it's, it's quite interesting. He's an older guy that's been around a while, but when the Cardinals signed him and he went to Double A, he just started hitting, and then he went to Triple A, continued to hit, and came into Big League camp, and he keeps hitting. So, you know, you don't know if maybe it's a system thing that that helped him, or maybe he figured it out at, at a later point of his career. But he's going to give the Cardinals some depth. He's he's an exciting player, and uh, I, I love when guys get their make their major league debuts. This is the best time of the year for me. I love. When John Hewlett down there at Bush Stadium mm-hmm. says now making his major league debut, that's one of the highlights. I don't care if it's on the, on the home team or the visiting team. I just love that because I know what a lot of these guys have gone through to get to that point and, and how exciting it is to, to get to see them achieve their goals and their friends and their family. Everybody's so excited for them. So you're going to see that in Bowman and Hazel Baker this year making their debuts and uh, it's going to be exciting. Yeah, and they both certainly have earned their spot on the roster, no doubt, going into Sunday. They really have. It's good to see yeah, that. Yeah, and, and, and Bowman, you know, he, he came in with the Rule 5, and mm-hmm. you know, I would have said he has no chance of making the team. And all of a sudden there's a couple injuries, and he's, you know, it's the same thing as Hazelbaker. He's still around. He's still going out and doing his job, and then a couple things happen, and now there's a spot open, and, and he slides right in there. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when guys get healthy and, and who's, who ends up sticking around. But those things have a way of working themselves out. And, uh, but, but, yeah, both of them had good springs, and, and uh, look, hopefully they get off to a good start at the beginning of the season. Mm-hmm. Well, talking about make, making your major league debut, you know, you go back and you look at your career. You're one of those guys that actually had Tommy John surgery when you were in the minors and had to overcome that, and then you made it to the majors. So you kind of defied the odds there a little bit yourself in making it to the big leagues the way that you did. <laughs> if you look at my minor league numbers, you'll wonder how in the world I ever made it to the major leagues. And uh, a lot of that had to do with that Tommy John. I, I was out of high school. I was 17 when I was drafted and uh, passed up a scholarship in Mizzou and, and went in, and, and I struggled for the first few years and then had Tommy John, and that really helped me mature and, and sit back and watch and learn, that, and not, not the, the physical side, but learn just the mental side of the game and what was going on. And it was easier for me to process after I sat out. It took me 22 months. I ended up having two elbow surgeries, and it was 22 months to the time I got back. And when I got back, I just felt like 
mentally I was so much farther ahead of a lot of these other guys because of what I had gone through. And so then you had the physical side onto it that I was healthy and I had, you know, some stuff that I could, could mix in there that, that was decent. And next thing you know, after six years in the minor leagues, I, I make that jump to the big leagues and, and was able to stay there. So everybody, that's the cool thing too, is everybody has a different story. Not everybody's the first round pick and spends a year or two in the minor leagues and just progresses and does well and then gets to the big leagues. It's, you know, everybody has a unique story, and that's when you start hearing about the Bowmans and, and the Hazel Bakers, and you start learning their story. That to me, that's the most interesting part of it. Yeah. Well, and again, your career was not as long in the major league as as well. I'm sure you wanted it to be. Eventually, the, the arm problem forced you out, but you certainly had a chance to taste some success. You definitely left your mark, and you were such an important part of the team in that 2011 World Championship season. You really were, particularly in the in the month of August. I think you led the National League, if I'm not mistaken. I think you led the National League in holds that year as a, as a middle reliever, and, of course, you did some starting pitching that year, too. And I think in the month of August alone in 2011, I think you had something like 11 appearances, but you only gave up one run in those 11 appearances. So, I mean, you did an outstanding job, particularly that season in 2011. Well, and when I, in 08, my first year, I, I kind of made my mark, and uh, Tony threw me in on opening day in a one nothing game uh, against Colorado, who just came off a World Series appearance, and, and, I, and I did well there, and he kept putting me in situations to, to see how I would handle it, and, and I did, I kept doing well, and if I had a situation I didn't do well in, he'd put me back in there and see how I handled, you know, not, not doing well the time before, and, and I, more times than not, I, I ended up doing okay in it, so by him putting me in those situations kept kept me on the roster because it, it, it took me from being the 25th guy on the roster and put me into a point where it was somebody that, that they wanted to keep there because I could pitch big innings. And as a young guy, that's all you can ask for is to put me in those tough situations and let me prove to you that I can do it. And if not, I'll go down to AAA and work on it. But, yeah, I was able to get up there and, and make my mark in the bullpen and pitch in the late innings there for, for three years. And then when Wainwright went down with Tommy John, you know, slide in the rotation, starting pitching was something that, that uh, Dave Duncan really uh, thought I could do, and I had I had a big uh, boost of confidence from him, and something that I thought I could do and wanted to try. I did it in the minor leagues, but I wanted to see if I could do it at the major league level, and did it for half a year, and and then started going south, and uh, my shoulder started you know, being a little achy there, and uh, so they put me to the bullpen, and and I just never never quite was able to recover from that, and ended up after that having four other surgeries. Wow. Uh, the next year having my first shoulder surgery and had three others trying to get it fixed and <clears throat> and it didn't didn't work but you know I got I, I pitched five years for the Cardinals I pitched uh, part of a year for the Rangers in, in the year uh, before I retired um, I, my my career is what it is you know I mean it's it's um, I feel like I went out there every chance I got the, the opportunity to take the ball did my best but I have some great uh, memories obviously have a, a really big World Series ring from the Cardinals, which I appreciate. Mm-hmm. But I have some great friendships, and it also has given me a, a great platform for the second phase of my life. And that's what you know I enjoy doing now, and able to, to live in my hometown and, and play for the team that I that I grew up watching and loving, and mm-hmm. won a World Series for that team. And then now I get to do some work on the radio, and and all those things are, are great. But it all kind of keeps me out there keeps my face out there and gives me an opportunity to to to, uh, to raise funds and awareness for these for these people in need and in particular these, these children in need uh, here in St. Louis and outside the country and I can tell you you know it's not a it's not a sales pitch it's not phony I mean all the other stuff I do I enjoy doing but the foundation stuff is it, it, it's what drives me it's what that's when I look at the next 30 years of my life of what I want to do I mean, it, it's centered around brace for impact and, and what we're doing in the community here and, and what we're doing in Haiti. And I, do, I look forward to, to that. And, and because of the platform that I've been given uh, through baseball, it allows me to do that for these kids. So that's, uh, that's the best part of my career, really, I can tell you, is, is, uh, is being able to use that platform for somebody else and, uh, and to be able to serve other people. Yeah, you know, you and Adam Wainwright have so much in common. I mean, you guys are both uh, outdoors guys. You both love uh, hunting and fishing. Uh, you both survived uh, Tommy John surgery and, and uh, <laughs> lived to tell about it and actually pitched pretty well following that. And, again, you both have this compassion uh, to help children and help those in need. And uh, it's just it's just great to see. And I, I wish you well as you continue on with this foundation. I think it's fantastic what you've set up and some of the things that you've done already 
with Brace for Impact, and I know it's just going to continue to grow, and we just hope that it, it does, and we want to encourage people again to get online and take a look at it and donate if they can. Again, the website is braceforimpact46.com. That's brace for Impact. 46.com and as you said we'll have an updated website coming up here uh here really really soon one more question before i let you go uh yadier molina being a former pitcher and having thrown to him talk about how special yadi is not only back when you pitched kyle but to the pitchers that are on that staff now with the cardinals well i mean he's he's the backbone of that team and and people don't realize the the little things that he does one of the things i asked him this spring is how do you keep that drive so uh, the thing that amazes me about him is that it could be a, a June game against the worst team in baseball in like the fourth inning, and something will happen, that, and he'll come out of there, and he'll be fist pumping, and he'll be so fired up. How do you keep that that drive for every pitch, every every game? You, you never take a day off, and and that makes his pitcher so much better. The fact that he's out there every pitch is he treats like like it's a playoff game, and you don't see that. From, from a lot of guys, especially with guys that have his success. It'd be easy for him to just kind of cruise through it, get through the end of the season, and the postseason lights are brighter, and then all of a sudden he wants to shine. But he, he's, he's like that consistently, every day, every inning, every pitch. And, and that's the thing that I admire most about Yachty. But you take a guy like Carlos Martinez, and I, nothing against Carlos, but there's a, there's a learning curve for these young guys. Joe Kelly, when he was in St. Louis, had a good three years, goes over to Boston, and he's struggling. And I, there was a, a quote that he had that said, I'm just now getting comfortable calling my own game. And it's like, you have three years in the big league, and you can't call your own game yet. Well, that's because Yachty did it for him. That's because Yachty <laughs> took all that thinking out of it. And Yachty just, he would put fingers down, and you would just go with it. So that goes to show you how big of an influence he is on these pitchers. Joe Kelly couldn't even call his own game after three years in the big leagues. Cause, and, and so Yachty speeds that learning curve up. So if you take Carlos Martinez, and you put him with anybody other than Yachty, I don't think he's an all-star. I don't mm-hmm. think he wins 15 games last year. I, I just I don't think he's there yet. I think Yachty has helped him progress so much faster than we would normally see because he can he can relate to him, he can talk to him, he, they, they have a, a good relationship, but he does all the thinking for him. And I think Carlos is, is learning and he's getting better in spring. I saw him interact with some other catchers, and, and he did a good job of setting pitches up, but – Yachty takes it to a whole new level. And so uh, if, if Yachty's healthy, this pitching staff is in great shape. If Yachty's hurt, nothing against Brian Pena or anybody else, there's just such a drop from Yachty to anybody else in this league that, that you're going to feel it. And and it, it's <clears throat> by him being around and just talking to the guys and all that helps. But, man, when he's behind the plate, he's putting those fingers down. You don't even have to think, like, is this is this the right thing I should be doing? He just puts the fingers down, you throw to the glove, and more times than not it works out. So he's uh, he's the heartbeat of this team, and – and uh, it was very weird to see Yachty in spring training without the catching gear on early on. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people started thinking, who's going to be the guy that takes over for Yachty? Do we have that yet? And I tell you what, whoever takes that over is going to be, they're, they're going to have a very, very tough job in front of them because, uh, in my opinion, Yachty's the best catcher that's ever played this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, staying healthy not only for Yachty but for everybody else is also going to be, again, such a key this year to this Cardinals team. I like the flexibility with Matt Holliday at first base this year, particularly against the left-handed pitchers. And, and again, as long as Holliday can stay healthy, that's going to give us many more options and flexibility there. Don't you agree? Yeah, and, and Matt's been healthy the majority of his career. I mean, last year he played in, I think, 74 games. That's the first time he's played under 100 games his whole career, going back to 2001 in the minor league. So this is a guy that – that is more times than not he's out there he's able to play 140 150 games so i don't look for that to be an issue with him he's obviously by looking at him you can tell he's in great shape and uh you know he's he's doing what he needs to do to to keep himself out there but yeah having him at first base against a left-handed pitcher certainly gives you the a more right-handed lineup and with matt adams and, and his struggles against left-handed pitching and and moss against lefties uh you know you put out you put matt over there and and you got your, your young guys out in the outfield with Tommy Pham and Gritchick and Scotty, and you let those guys, they can pretty much track anything down between the three of those, and uh, and you're, you're a lot more right-handed. So it'll be interesting to see. We know Mike likes to switch the, switch the lineup around. He doesn't like just one one consistent lineup, and so I'm sure he's going to have some fun playing with that. And and, uh, and Matt did a great job at first base this spring. I, to be honest with you, I didn't know how he would do it. I mean, at first base, it's not – it's not like you just stand over there and don't do anything. There's a lot of things that go into it, 
and him and Jose Okendo worked very hard this off season to make sure that that was an option for Mike, and it's interesting to see how he uses that now. All right. We've been visiting with Kyle McClellan. Kyle, appreciate the visit this morning. Always fun to to chat with someone like you who's been in the big leagues and has a different perspective on it. And I love the insight that you gave on the Cardinal broadcast this year, the games that you did on Cardinals.com with Tom Ackerman. Again, I thought you two did a great job together. and Glad you had the opportunity to do it, and it's been fun visiting with you today. And, again, we want to remind people about his uh, foundation, Brace for Impact. And, again, you can support Brace for Impact and what they're doing for children in Haiti and, and things that they're going to be doing probably for a lot of other children in many places as well. And the website, again, is braceforimpact46.com. Kyle, again, thanks for joining us this morning. Have a great weekend, and go Cardinals, right? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You bet. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.